welcome to Pathway. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we're going to start off the morning with some worship, praising our God. So would you sing along with us and come let us worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow. comes with sacrifices, um, and that comes with some ups and some downs, um, and it's not always going to be the easiest thing, um, but he's still worthy, and he, he's, he still should be worshiped, and we should still lift him up, and he's, no matter what the day holds in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, he's still worthy of our worship, and he's still worthy of our praise. And so as believers, we magnify him, we lift him up. 
regardless of what the day holds. Um, in Psalm 34, uh, verse one through three puts it so well. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So let's sing this out.
the beginning and one with God the one most high your hidden glory in creation and now we
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. God, you have given us such a privilege of coming before you and knowing that we're praying to a God who hears us, to a God who sees us, to a God who answers us, and that we can come to you through the name of Jesus, the wonderful, beautiful, powerful name of Jesus, that our prayers don't go unheard or unanswered because of Jesus. So Father, as we take this throughout our week, help us to remember that your name has power, that you've given us Jesus so that we can live life in you right here as we walk through this life and then eternally with you forever because of Jesus. So Father, we love you and we thank you and it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray, amen. Isn't it a privilege to get to sing those words together, to gather each and every week to be able to sing words of praise and beauty to Jesus. It's just, it's a privilege we get to do that. Well, you know you hear us talk a lot about how we want this to be the most welcoming place that you are at the entire week. So we're gonna let you do that. We're gonna have you greet somebody around you, tell them your name, ask them their name. It is the cold and flu season, so you can bump fists or something like that if you want, but take a moment just to make someone feel welcome. That's great, I'm hearing a lot of names being exchanged, so that is really great. Well, my name is Becky Johnson, and I'm on staff here at Pathway as Women's Ministry Director, and I just wanna say welcome to each one of you. If this is your first week here, we are especially glad that you're here, and if you're worshiping right here in this room with us, whether you're worshiping with us online or whether you're up in the venue, welcome this weekend. It's, it's just great to be able to spend part of our weekend together. We're gonna continue to worship through our giving, so I'm gonna invite the team to come forward, and as they do that, can we just pray again together another time, um, and we'll just pray over our offerings. So let's do that together. Dearest Heavenly Father, again, we just come to you humbly and thankfully and gratefully, and we just acknowledge your goodness and your greatness, and Lord, that you are the giver of all good things. And as we are able to give back to you out of what you have already so generously given us, I just pray, Father, that you will Use this in your kingdom and the work that you are doing here, near, and far. And I just thank you that you invite us to play a part in what you're doing. And so it's in your name again that we pray. Amen. If you just want to make sure that the buckets make it all the way across the aisles into the walls, we'll be around to pick those up in just a second. And while they're doing that, I want to let you know of a couple of things that are taking place so that you're all in the know and that you know what's going on. The first thing is the last couple of weeks, you've been hearing us talk a little bit about abundance. Well, abundance is finally next weekend. It's going to be here. And we are hoping and praying that this entire stage, it's already started over there, is just filled with bags of food. And um, the food is going to bless some different people in a couple of different ways. I'm gonna share those with you. First of all, it's gonna to go to families who are just facing some challenging circumstances in life right now. And so we'll get to bag up some groceries and bless those families and show love uh, to them as they walk through the different circumstances that life is throwing at them right now. And then it will go to also stock our food pantry, which is actually used through the entire year. So that food pantry will be stocked and ready for the year. And then we'll also get to provide some resources as well to other local food banks. So again, we're praying that the stage is completely full of food um, next week. And so it's your time to be able to donate that. There's black abundance bags out in the lobby, the cafe lobby that you can get. It has some suggested uh, donated items that you can include in there. 
If you don't get a black bag, you can bring it in regular grocery bags next week. We would love to just, again, see this filled, stage filled, and we're excited about that. And then you can also serve as, and be a part of that through serving. Um, after the 11 o'clock service, this place will be torn down and tables will be set up. Bags will be filled and groceries will be sorted. And we need volunteers to do that as well. We also need some volunteers who can lift some boxes from the trucks to the uh, food bank. And uh, be heavy lifters. We would love to have you guys serve in that way. You can sign up to serve on the PCC app. You can sign up to serve on the website. Or back in the atrium lobby, there is a, the cafe kiosk where there's a, some of your Abundance team volunteers that would love to just be able to talk to you about how to sign up and what kinds of um, places there are for you to serve. So go see them as well. The last thing I want to tell you about is the blue section, which is this section right here. Today is your Super Bowl celebration party. So there is soup back there for you. You get to have lunch together. There's some other snacks and some other food. And be connected with some of the people that you are seated, seated with each and every week. So take a minute to go back there, meet some people, have lunch together, enjoy each other's company. We would love to have you do that as well. Well, this is the first week in a brand new series that we're moving into called True Riches. And it's a series we get to just take a look at the goodness of God, again, the giver of all good things, what he's doing in our lives and what he's provided for us and his goodness in that. So we're excited for that to start. So let's get ready to listen and watch. Man, welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here today at Pathway. For those of us that are in the worship center, for those of you that are watching online, those up in the venue, and those in the comfortable seats out in the lobby, I'm glad that you have decided you're going to be part of what God is doing here at Pathway. Special shout out to the young adult group from St. John Mennonite Church over in Pandora, Ohio. We're really glad that you came over to worship with us today. Thanks for being here. Tell my friends, the Scots over there, that I said hello to them because... That is a fun relationship that we had and just found out that that connection is there. My name is Brent. I'm one of the pastors here at Pathway. And for those of you that have been around Pathway for a while, you know that just as we've sung, as we've worshiped today, we love to talk to people about Jesus. We love to tell people about who Jesus is and what he's done because the Bible tells us he gives us an amazing invitation. He's God come from heaven to take the penalty of our sins upon himself. And he offers us eternal life as a free gift. And he simply asks, that we trust him, we believe him, we decide that we're gonna exercise our faith in him. And frankly, friends, that's, that's the essence of true riches. I really want you to keep that in mind today because as we're gonna talk in these next four weeks about the material things that we have in our lives, all of that revolves around the fact that Jesus gives us every spiritual blessing, every emotional blessing, every physical blessing, every material blessing of the things that we call our own, and I hope you don't tune this out today because when we start to talk about money and wealth and riches in church, people get a little freaky about that sometimes. I mean, it may be that you're here today and you're really struggling with your finances and, and the Bible talks about that. As a matter of fact, in the next few weeks, Pastor Ron is gonna talk about the fact that, that we can worry about money and we can be anxious and the Bible speaks to that. He's gonna talk about the fact that, that we can be jealous of other people's things and we can covet things. You know the Bible speaks about that. And we can also be selfish, not share what God's entrusted to us. But, but today we're gonna to talk about the fact that we can actually feel so good about our money. We can feel so good about our stuff and enjoy the things of this life so much that we don't really understand what God intends for that. And frankly, we can become prideful whenever we focus on what we have and what we call our own. I mean, you can love your stuff so much, bottom line, is that you don't love others. And you can enjoy the good things in life so much that we can become obsessed with those things. And we're gonna talk about that, but the big idea that we're gonna examine today is that our enjoyment can become an obsession 
if we don't see everything as a gift from God. We're gonna talk about enjoying the good things of life. We're gonna talk about the fact that if we enjoy them to a place where we focus on only them and don't understand that God gives us gifts to enjoy in this life, then we can become obsessed with them and our lives can revolve around them and it can lead us into a bad place. And we're going to look at that from a passage of scripture maybe you've glossed over or maybe you've read before from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now I'd encourage you to take your Bibles, turn to this passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6, because we're going to look at some other scripture around it. And yet I want you to realize that as we look at this passage written from an early church leader to a young pastor, it builds on the truth of many things that Jesus said. Because Jesus spoke about money and material things a lot. As a matter of fact, a sixth of his teaching was on money. And a third of his parables had to do with material things. He's the one who said, where your treasure is, there your what? Heart will be also. Because he knows where we spend our money and where we put our time and where we put our effort really shows the priorities of our lives. And the apostle Paul, who wrote to this young pastor by the name of Timothy, said this in one of the last letters of the New Testament. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but when I read that passage, my mind starts to go a few different directions. As a matter of fact, one of the things is I say, well, he must be talking to somebody else because he's talking about rich people, right? I mean, and I don't feel rich. I mean, maybe he's talking to Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cow Patties, who, Cowboys, right? I'm a Steelers fan, just like this guy with a jacket down here. So I take a shot at the Cowboys once in a while. Jerry Jones parked his $250 million yacht in Miami Harbor while he was attending the Super Bowl that neither the Steelers or the Cowboys played in, by the way. And so I think, man, he's a rich guy, right? I mean, that's not me. He's rich. And then I start to think about the players on the field, that they maybe make just a few million dollars, but, but they're rich compared to me. And then I think about the people that spent $7,000 on tickets to the Super Bowl. And, and, and that's not money that I would necessarily spend that would want to do that. And then I think about all of that and, well, maybe someone who I consider rich is somebody that just has more than I do or you do. We'll talk about that. Some of us can say, man, I understand the uncertainty part because I never saw that, that, that downsizing come. I never expected to lose my job. I never expected to see the stock market dive right as I was ready to retire. I mean, we can understand that and we say, you know what? Sometimes I really don't feel like God richly provides. He maybe provides for some people richly, but, but, but let's face it, some of us don't feel that and don't sense that in our lives. And then we get down to this last part about he gives everything for our enjoyment. And, and my response may be like yours is, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. I mean, aren't, aren't we supposed to be spiritual in church and talk about important things? And, and if we talk about things that God gives for our enjoyment and our pleasure and our physical well-being, well, well, I think those are all valid questions. So in order to answer them, we're going to kind of take some questions from the bottom up and, and we're going to ask the things that I'd ask you to spend some time writing in on your sermon outline this morning. First of all, with this one saying, does God really provide for our enjoyment? Since we may not think that sounds very spiritual, and we may wonder about that, you'll need to decide that, obviously, but, but the truth is, this scriptural passage, and, and throughout the Bible, says yes. Now, now you know that when, when this passage says, Timothy writes, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, he doesn't mean that, that everybody has the same things. He doesn't mean that everybody has everything. I mean, that's just obvious, isn't it? Because we all have different incomes. We have different net worths. We live in different homes. We have different jobs. We live in different lives. We have different lives. But when God entrusts things to us, those things that he gives us, all the things that he gives us, this passage says, are for our enjoyment. 
And the word literally means having physical pleasure in that. It means that, that you buy something and you go, wow, I'm really glad that I have that. I really enjoy that. It's a great thing to have. Uh, years ago, when Lori and I were living up in New England, um, we had a big lot and I had a lousy lawnmower and I finally bought a big walk behind John Deere lawnmower. And, and seriously, I mean, I got pleasure out of that stupid thing because I didn't have to push it the way I did my other lawnmower, and I'd go right up the hills with that lawnmower, and I had great physical pleasure while exercising physical work with a stupid lawnmower, right? I mean, you have stuff like that. I mean, it's you finally got that set of golf clubs that you wanted, or you say, man, these are the most comfortable shoes that I've ever had. I love these shoes. Or, or you buy the purse or the watch or whatever your thing is, and and if you ever felt guilty about that, I mean, that's something you need to really come to grips with because the Bible says that God gives us good things for our enjoyment. Now, that's really what we've been talking about for the last several weeks here at Pathway because as Pastor Ron has been talking about our work and how God wants us to use the opportunities that we have in our jobs for the kingdom of Christ and to, to walk through the opportunities to tell more people about him, he read a passage of scripture that I'm going to read to you. We're not going to put it on the screen from Ecclesiastes 3 that says this, because the concept is that our work is a gift from God and everything that we do should be fulfilling for us. The writer of Ecclesiastes said, I know there is nothing better for men than to be happy, for people to be happy and do good while they live. Happiness and good deeds. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift from God. Doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? But it's in the Bible. It's, it's truth that God's revealed to us through through a man that, that went through a lot of ups and downs in his life, an ancient king who really made some dumb mistakes in life, but at the end of his life says, hey, you know what? I know God wants us to be happy and do good, to eat and to drink and find satisfaction in life. And then later on in Ecclesiastes, he says this in chapter five, moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. I mean, God, God gives us things, not all the same things, but God gives us all the things that he gives us and the ability to enjoy them and say, God, this is really cool. Thank you for, for this thing in this world that I can enjoy because it's really a gift from you. Hold on to that idea. One Christian author said, no good purpose is served by pretending that God did not intend us to enjoy life because you know why? God's ultimately responsible for all the stuff that we have. God is responsible for the ability that we have to work. God is responsible for the things that we're able to buy. God's responsible for a whole lot more than we give him credit for in life. And, and yet in our lives, we found that we enjoy some things, don't we? When we were kids, we enjoyed bicycles and baseball cards and video games and toys. Then we got a little older and we started to care more about how we dressed and, and what kind of car we rode in and we started to put a house together. And so we cared about furniture and, and collectibles and, and then we get a little extra money and we start caring about, caring about boats and travel and trips and we still care about trinkets and technology and all kinds of things. And and probably the Holy Spirit's going to bring some things to our minds as we talk about this today because when we don't really understand that all of those things are good gifts from God, what we're going to find out is that they can become the focus of our lives. We can obsess about those things. And what this passage is telling us is that we are not to put our hope in them because it's going to do something within us. So the second question is, why shouldn't we put our hope in wealth? I mean, why shouldn't we sit around and go, I am so glad I've amassed this money. I'm so glad that I have this much stuff. I'm so glad that, that I have accomplished this and I've bought that and I've done that. And you see, there's a lot of I in that, isn't there? Because whenever we start to focus on those things and think that we're the ones responsible for them, it, it actually contributes, the answer to that is, is to arrogance, to pride. Now, this passage contains a lot of interesting words in the original language. I kind of geek out on this stuff once in a while. And, and you need to, need to realize that there's some really unique words here in this passage 
that, that this early church writer, Paul, never used any place else. And one of them is this word for arrogance. It talks about a personal sense of pride, an idea of saying that, that because of what I have, you know, because of whatever, I'm a little better than you. God must love me a little bit more than you. God must have decided to bless me. And so we know that if we equate material blessings too often with material wealth. We know that, that, that all of us can fall into that trap. And, and it's not just the rich people. It's not just the people who have more than us. It's, it's sometimes us. Now, Jerry Jones was not the only NFL owner that had his super yacht parked in Miami Harbor. Uh, there were four NFL owners, and there were a lot of other people that had fancy boats out there. And, and in my warped mind, I start to think, I wonder if they stood on the decks of their super yachts and started to compare them with each other, you know? <laughs> Did Jerry look at somebody else's and go, Wow, that boat's bigger than mine. I wonder how much that cost him. Or did the other guy look at his and say, he's got two helipads on his yacht. I mean, I've only got one, and I think my helicopter's worth less than his. I mean, there's this, there's this sense of no matter where we are in life that I think we tend to compare with other people. And again, we need to realize that that's just not the super wealthy. That's just not somebody else. That's us, isn't it? Have you ever compared your house with somebody else's house? Have you ever compared your car with somebody else's car? Have you ever compared your clothes with somebody else's and said, wow, he's got to have some bucks to afford a suit like that? Or have you looked at somebody else's jewelry or heard about somebody else's vacation? And, and talking about that and realizing that that is part of all of our lives, if we focus on ourselves and we, we become obsessed with what we have, that builds right into the pride of who we are because we start to say, hey, you know, I've got a bigger house and I've got a nicer car and I can take fancier vacations. And on the other hand of that, on the other side, if we don't have those things, we can start to feel inferior, can't we? And say, well, my house isn't nice enough and my car is not cool enough and it's been years since I've had a vacation. And all of that gets us to a place where we can feel either arrogant or quite inadequate and Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth. Now, I'm going to incriminate myself in this because I have something that brings me great joy in my life. And that's antique cars, okay? When I was about five years old, I rode in a 1922 Model T Ford, and I never got that out of my system. I mean... I have loved antique cars ever since I've been a little kid. And I have antique cars. I have a couple of them, as a matter of fact, to be full disclosure with you. Um, I love the old stuff, like from the turn of the 20th century, the stuff that you have to crank like this or you have to call a tow truck when it breaks down. And, and I don't love my cars more than I love my kids or my wife or Jesus or you. I just want you to know that. But, but it's real easy for those of us that have that hobby to become obsessed with them. It is, and I've talked to some of you about this, and I warned a couple of you that I was gonna incriminate myself in this, but, but we who love cars, whether it's antique or classics or any kind of cars, hot rods or anything else, we can become obsessed with them, okay? We really can. I mean, we can look on websites and see the new cars and how much they cost, and, and, and we can look and go find them, and we can buy them, and, and we can put more money into them than we can ever get back out of them, which is really a bad idea, by the way, and we can think of what needs to be done to them, and we can polish them, and we can wash them, and, and if we really become obsessed with them, we can take our lawn chairs, and we can say, I'm not going to worship God on Sundays, I'm going to go someplace, and... I'm going to sit in front of my car and let other people worship it. I mean, don't be haters, okay? Don't judge me because you can do the same thing with your golf clubs or your gadgets or the next gun that you want to buy. And all of us have our thing that we just have to be really careful to know that our ultimate hope can't be in those things. And those things have to be looked at as gifts from God because if we don't look at them as gifts from God, we start to get our priorities out of place. And Paul says... Don't be arrogant or put our hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. I mean, this idea of something that is uncertain means that it's not going to last forever. It means that it's not what's most important in life. And if we think that, that the stock market or job losses or financial difficulties of our time aren't enough to get us to a point where we realize that we don't know whether things are up or down or what's going to take place next with China or the United States or anything else, 
we just need to realize that, that if we are putting our hope in our things, and if we're so obsessed with the stuff of life that we worship it and make it an idol in our lives, then we've really put our priorities in misplaced places. There's a passage in Proverbs 23 that says this, cast but a glance at riches, for they are gone, or and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off into the sky like an eagle. I mean, it is true that all of the stuff that we love and that God gives to us to enjoy are only temporary things. We're not gonna take all this stuff into heaven. And you know, and we start playing around with ideas about, I wonder what heaven's gonna be like. Is there gonna be old cars? Is there gonna be golf courses? Is there gonna be all this stuff? You know what? We really misplaced our priorities even then because the bottom line is there's never a hearse that has a U-Haul behind it. All the things of this world are always temporary. And the Bible tells us they're only tools to be able to use to help other people come to know Jesus. And, and frankly, they're tests for us because whatever we are enjoying, my contention is that we should use those hobbies and those good things in life to build into other people's lives so we can talk to them about Jesus. Now really, understanding everything is God's and that we're only managers of those things whether it's cars or houses or toys or trinkets or anything else, is, is a bottom line characteristic of a committed follower of Jesus. We talk here about the fact that we don't really own anything, it all belongs to him, that we simply manage what God's entrusted to us. That's a bottom line message of a follower of Jesus who is really committed to him. But in the context of this passage, in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and following, look in your scripture or your electronic device or follow along, this is what Timothy Here's from the Apostle Paul. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation. Not all of them, but some do fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money not money itself, but the love of money, that obsession with things is the root of all kinds of evil. For some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, over and over again, we find in scripture that it's easy for us to get focused on the stuff of life. We love the things that God has given to us. While we can't enjoy them, we can't become obsessed with them. And so the big question of all of this, as Paul writes to Timothy, where he says, command those who are rich, is this one, is who is he really speaking to? And, and you're gonna have to decide that. Because you might need to write your name in there you might just want to put the word me in that, or you might want to leave it blank because my contention is, as we look around the world, it's not just the Jerry Jones or the football players or the people that went to the Super Bowl, and I hope they were some of you that might have even gone to the Super Bowl and enjoyed that because the rest of us did as we watched it, but my contention is that wherever we find ourselves in the scale of things, and what I'm going to show you right now is that Almost all of us are rich. Now, when you look around the world, this is one of the stats that a, a, a website called Global, uh, globalrichlist.com puts out for us. As a matter of fact, if you go to www.globalrichlist.com, you can find out if you plug in your net worth, if you know that, or your annual income, where you actually fall in relationship to the entire world. It's based on some schematics and some statistics that are intriguing. www.globalrichlist.com also has these stats that if you make $50,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of income owners in the world. $50,000 a year. If you make $35,000 a year, you're in the top 5%. If you make $15,000 a year, some of our high school students around here make $15,000 a year. You are in the top 15% of people in the world because we know that the world is very poor. We know the world is very needy. We know the world struggles in many, many ways. And friends, when we live in this country, we end up having an income that goes far beyond that. As a matter of fact, if you live here in Allen County, the median income right now is $53,402. So the median income in this county where we live is higher than 
the 50% of the world. So we'll, we'll leave this up here now. If the world were 100 people, is another stat I wanna share with you. This is true, 80 would live in substandard housing, or they do live in substandard housing, 50 are malnourished, 70 can't read, and six out of 100 people in the world have one half of the world's wealth, and they live here in the good old USA. And we hear a lot about the top 1% today, right, in the United States. But in, being in the top 1% of the world and understanding where we fit and understanding the wealth that is in this country is amazing. And by the way, if the world were 100 people, 50 of them would be women, 50 would be men, and 70 of them don't know Jesus. They don't have a relationship with him as a savior. So you have to decide whether or not you're rich in this present world or not. Now, I admit, some of us are, are struggling by the world's standards, but if we have, by, by standards here, but if we have a roof over our head, if we have food for tomorrow, we're, we're far above average, and we're far above the rest of the world, and frankly, furthermore, if you realize how many of us make much more than $50,000 a year, make big incomes, if you start adding our homes and our cars and our 401ks and our IRAs and our lake homes and our vacation homes, let's just admit, we are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, even in this church, even sitting in this room today. And in the process of that, we can realize what this passage goes on to say. God is not going to heap guilt upon us. God is not going to say, sell it all and give it away necessarily, but he's gonna tell us to do a few things. Is since we're rich, we need to, first of all, we need to do good. I'm gonna read the whole passage. It says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. There's three things that he lines out for us, and the first one is this idea of doing good. It just simply means being nice to people. It's also an interesting word in the New Testament. It's used in Acts chapter 14, because when the apostle Paul is being a uh, someone who is, is sharing the truth with Je of Jesus with people, and he does some miracles, there's a group of people that decide they're gonna worship him because he's doing such a great job in their life. And Paul says, hey, wait a minute, this isn't about me, this is about God. God loves you, and he talks about God and says, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness, same word for good in 1 Timothy 6. By giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons, he provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Paul's saying, you know what? I'm not good. God is good. But as God shows his kindness and goodness, he writes later to Timothy and says, you know what? Isn't that the bottom line of what we can be? It's let's just be good to people. Let's be nice to people. Let's be kind to people. I mean, we have a lot, we're entrusted with a lot. And so as God does good, we are to do good too, but we are also, second of all, to be rich in good works because that's exactly how he phrases that. He says, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and that means that wealth imposes some heavy responsibility on us. It means that since God has been so good to us, we have the opportunity to do good for other people. And so we look for ways that we can be involved in each other's lives. We look for the opportunities that God gives to us. We say, hey, you know what? I wanna share what I have because God has been so good to me. Matter of fact, there's an old verse in Luke chapter 12 that says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Those are Jesus' words. I memorized them out of the old King James Version of the Bible as a kid that says, to whom much is given, much is required. Meaning that since God has given us the stuff that we have, doesn't it make the sense that we're supposed to do good and be good, and yet this passage goes on and it finally says, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. I phrased it this way, just, just do what this passage says say that, that since God has been so good to us, since he has shown his kindness to us, since, since we have so much opportunity available to us, we need to make sure that we're the kind of people who don't just you know, throw a few bucks in the bucket when it goes past or text once in a while whenever we're supposed to do that, but, but, but we have an attitude that says, as I enjoy all these good things in life, 
then I want to be generous with, with what God entrusts to me, and I want to use those things for his kingdom. And, and again, these are some amazing words because the word for generous means to be good and noble and, and go beyond a share. Of, of the idea of ready to share talks about the idea that we're connected with each other in Christ. It uses the same word that, that we use for fellowship, koinonia, and suggests that while it's good to share our money, we have to share our hearts with each other too. That it's not enough just to say, hey, I'm going to pay for somebody else to go to do that. I'm going to give because I'm required to. It talks about the fact that we are to have kind hearts and we are to have generous hands. To be able to love people and to share with them as God gives us the opportunity. And it's amazing how God sometimes teaches us that. In America, we're pretty generous. Let me show you some stats that I played around with this week. In the past year, and in a couple of these stats, I had to average a few things. Americans in a year have given $11.2 billion to disaster relief. Now, this isn't what the government sent to other places. This is what individuals have given, about $11.2 billion. In a year, Americans give about $11.4 billion to world missions. Isn't that cool? And American churches receive and are given 114.9, almost $115 billion by Americans. I mean, that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty generous. It's amazing to think how much that really is, because I don't know about you, but a billion dollars is a lot of money to me. And and that is, is huge until we start to think about some of the other things that we spend money on. Um, how about movie tickets? Like to go to the movies? Like to see a good show out there? You know how much we spend in movie tickets in a year in America? About $11 billion. <laughs> about the same amount as we've given to disaster relief and world missions is what we spend as Americans in movie tickets. Now, I understand that today is National Pizza Day. Did you guys know that? Somebody told me this after the service, and I actually went to one of my favorite pizza joints this week and got this box because I love the cheesy, crunchy, pepperoni goodness of a good pizza, right? And I'm always excited whenever somebody invites me out for pizza or has pizza. And you know how much money we spent in a year? Pizza, America? $38 billion for this cheesy, crunchy, pepperoni goodness. Now, I also thought I should look at some of the other things that I enjoy in life, and so here's a couple of them. This is my favorite potato chips in the whole world. Years ago, I think they were the first kettle-cooked potato chips I ever had, Cape Cod potato chips from Hyannis, Hyannis, Massachusetts, and I am a Coke guy. I want you to realize, don't hate me again, Pepsi lovers, but I love the Steelers, I love Cape Cod potato chips, I love Coca-Cola, and on chips and pop alone in the United States in a year, we spend $72.5 billion. 72.5. Now, that's a whole lot more than we spend on disaster relief, that's a whole lot more than we spend on world missions. And I thought about something else that is in this world, and that is alcohol, and in the United States, in a year, last year, we spent $253.8 billion in beer, wine, alcohol. Kind of gives perspective, doesn't it? That while we say we are generous, while we say that there are things that we do not obsess about, or things that we should prioritize more than some of the other things in life, we have to be really careful, friends, that as we decide what we're gonna spend our treasure on and how we're going to use what God entrusts to us, that we don't fall into the trap of spending more on temporary things and just pleasurable things than the things that are gonna make a difference for other people to come to know Jesus and do what this passage says in verse 19 because Paul says in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may be able to take hold of the life that is truly life. You see, when we spend what God wants us to spend on things that are important, it stores up treasures for ourselves in the future so we can experience God's rewards. So someday we can look back and say, hey, you know what, I had a lot 
and I was faithful in what I had. I had a lot and I did a lot. I had opportunities and I used those opportunities for people to come to know Jesus. The world is in great need, that is absolutely true. And there's a very convicting book by the name of Radical that a guy named David Platt wrote that says something like this. He says, there'll be very few Americans that someday stand before God and he'll say, hey, you know what? You gave too much. (laughs) You know, you should have kept more for yourself. You shouldn't have been so generous with people because it incriminates all of us to realize that that we are the kind of people that, that have many good blessings in life that we're to enjoy, but we have to determine the choices we make with all that God entrusts to us. I don't know about you, but as Lori and I are doing our taxes, we're looking at what we gave, not only to the church, but to lots of other places this past year. We're kind of evaluating where we stand and all that and where we go as we go into the new year. I just never want to get to a point where I'm saying, I'm spending more money on things that aren't going to last in this world than things that are going to make a difference for eternity. And, and while I'd encourage you to do the exact same thing on your taxes as you look at it, let me give you a couple object lessons. A couple things that I think will be easy for us to take this passage and to put it in practice this week so we'll be prepared for what Ron has to share with us in the weeks ahead. Uh, for one thing, the abundance food drive that we've already talked about. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, go get some groceries, bring it in. It's just a great object lesson to say, hey, here's something I can do to help other people with. Also, in March, we're going to do what you've done before here at Pathway called Feed My Starving Children. And we're gonna put together meals for like 230,000 people in a day and a half. And that's gonna cost us about $48,000. We've budgeted 20,000 of that. And we're gonna ask that 1,000 families give 28 bucks so we can pack all these meals for 230,000 people around the world. I mean, we're gonna ask you, and Ron will do this next week, either to text the money or to put a check in or to take that, that cold, hard, musty cash that you carry around still and a thousand of us to put 28 bucks in. Great, great object lesson. Because this is, this is what I want you to really think about this week is, as you do those things, is would you be willing to pray a prayer like this? Just says, thank you, Jesus. For, for this gift, whatever it might be. Um, how can I use it for your kingdom? And this is what I've been doing this week because I'm always preaching to myself before I'm preaching to you. I've, I've been walking out in my garage and saying to the stuff out there and to Jesus, thank you for these gifts. How can I use them for your kingdom? And, and I'll, I'll tell you, if you ever wanna know how I do that, um, I've been, I stood in my basement today because I just put new shelves down there and rearranged them and I looked at all that junk and I said, thank you, Jesus, for these gifts. <laughs> I don't even know why I have some of this stuff. How can I use it for your kingdom? And so I started to pull stuff off there for the garage sale that's coming up uh, in the next few months. I, I, I walked in my closet, especially on my wife's side of the closet, and I've said, Lord, thank you for all these gifts. All right, guys, you can do that. Ladies, you can do the same thing with him because we've got some guys around here that dress nicer than, than the rest of us do. Thank you for these gifts. I mean, just look at the stuff that you have. Think of the health that God gives to you. Go to your job tomorrow before you have a meal this week. And would you just pray that prayer? Say it out loud with me. Thank you, Jesus, for this gift. How can I use it for your kingdom? You might be amazed the way that God starts to open up our hearts and say, you know what? I can use this hobby for him. I can use this stuff for him. I can use this day for him. I can use this food for him. I can use this life for him. I mean, that becomes very personal, but that is so real in each of our lives because what really matters is what will last into eternity. And that's where we come back to who Jesus is and what he's done. This isn't a bait and switch message. This is the true riches. That God loved us so much that he forgives our sins, that he gives us eternal life. He gives us a full, meaningful, abundant life now in the fullness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm gonna ask you to stand with us and we're gonna sing a song to close out and just be reminded that if you don't know him, we would love to talk to you after the service. If you wanna learn more about following him, there'll be people down here for prayer. And as we sing, let's sing to the Lord and let's trust him to continue to guide us in life and show us his goodness. Or come to the altar in the Father's arms are open wide in 
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and I'll come to the altar in the Father's arms are open wide and forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of we want you to leave with today, that he is our savior, that he wants to lead our lives. And as I read this passage from the book of Ephesians, please be reminded as you leave that there'll be people down here for prayer. There are people that love to talk to you at guest services. If you're a guest, if you wanna know what to do at Pathway and how to get more involved, stop at Next Steps out there. But listen to these words, the apostle Paul writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. And so, Father, I pray that these people who are your gifts to this world would use all that they are and all they have for your glory, for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you as you do that.